Okay, thank you everybody for being here and thank you for being with us again at the Atlanta Radical Book Fair. After our two year absence, it feels really good to be back. Uh, it's a, my pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, William C. Anderson. <laughs> William is the author of A Nation on No Map and the co-author of As Black as Resistance with Zoe Samudzi. William is also the co-founder of the Offshoot Journal and a scholar of Martin Sostre and has worked closely with Lorenzo Quamboa Irvin and Jonina Abram Irvin. And William's work, as you well know, has contributed to a new generation's critical analysis of state power and has coincided with and influenced a resurgent interest in black anarchism. We are honored to have William with us here tonight and thank you for your attendance and please give it up for William. How are y'all doing today? Thank you for having me. Um, this is the first public event that I've done in the US in a few years. So it's, it's nice to be back in, in person with everybody. And I'm, I'm excited to, to talk with you all today and uh, have a little bit of a, a conversation about statelessness, um, which is one of the main things that informs a lot of what I'm writing about anarchism. And so I want to try to have this conversation and uh, exchange with you all where I'm actually speaking to a condition that I feel can inform a lot of our politics and our strategy going forward. And I want to use some real world examples of the things that are happening around us as well as some historical context from the past. And so I'm going to read a little bit. Um, I know that that's boring and I apologize in advance because I do want to just read some things I wrote briefly and then I want to uh, speak a little bit more freely and then we can get into the Q&A. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. What does the state do for stateless people? What does citizenship mean for the undocumented? Can crossing a border guarantee safety? We know the answers to many of these questions are particularly distressing. They highlight a reality that disrupts the comfortable narratives handed down to us by nationalisms, patriotisms, and convenient histories of all sorts. However, there are people who are constantly on the move whose stories tell us otherwise. I want to read an excerpt from my book, The Nation on No Map. I was raised by parents who informed me that I was not quite a citizen of the United States. This information influenced how I perceived all of the things I would experience throughout my life as a black person in this country. By the time I was a teenager and I had begun to do community organizing work, that's when I truly became immersed in questions of my placement in this society. Years of labor in different spaces led me to the immigrant rights movement and after my home state of Alabama passed the Beeson Hammond Alabama Taxpayer and Citizen Protection Act, more commonly known as HB 56. This anti-immigrant bill was a part of a spate of similar legislation at the time that followed Arizona's passage of SB 1070. I became involved in my state because I understood the limits of citizenship as a black American supposedly recognized as citizen. I was not an immigrant, but I was the descendant of black migrants who had moved all around the United States trying to escape the violence of racism and white supremacy. I tried to explain as much in the immigrant rights movement to curious parties who were intrigued and fascinated by my involvement. They saw my organizing and my advocacy as a charitable work 
or only some sort of type of symbolic solidarity. I can even recall experiences where undocumented activists who were white demanded that I take more risk than them because I had papers. They held citizenship over my head in a way that led me to interrogate my position even more. It was by repeatedly explaining that being black was not a safe haven that I first became interested in exploring anarchism. I'd seen what the state was capable of for years, but I gained deeper perspective during the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE, incursions against communities waged during the Obama administration. Late nights working alongside others on deportation cases, call campaigns, protests, civil disobedience, and fighting detention centers helped frame my thinking. I saw the damage the idea of citizenship can cause, and it gave me insights that I now write about at length. This coincided at a time in my life when I bounced around between ideas and sets of politics, again questioning identity and placement. I ultimately met black anarchist Lorenzo Camboa Irvin and Janina Irvin while I was co-leading a Southern organizers workshop. That chance meeting flipped everything I thought I knew about on its head and recognized my perspective and, sorry, reorganized my perspective with new language and political education that helped me find my voice. Past frustrations I had had in movement spaces and on the left were much clearer to me after I spent years reading and taking black anarchism into consideration. That's what brings me to this current moment. And that's an excerpt from my book, The Nation on No Map. So there are a plethora of tendencies that would have us think that liberation lies in a better state and or a better citizenship contract. Liberals will tell you that the US state needs to be reformed through piecemeal efforts and worked on be to better meet the needs of people it was designed to exclude. Various state socialist models have traditionally advocated and fought to seize the state completely instead of piecemeal legislation within its current economic framework. What's true is that the pathway to betterment is through the machinery of the state for both. For ages now, the primary way to conceptualize revolution in the Western radical imaginary has been to have a revolution that overturns the ruling class and establishes a new arrangement in its place. This has led to the founding of new states and the reform of existing ones, each with their own specific context and situations, making promises to the oppressed about deliverance from what was, from once what was, from what once was, excuse me. The many states I could have named, I could name and have, deli have delivered and not delivered upon these promises while entering into the game of global capitalism. Their terms and conditions have even required them to use methods at odds with liberation. Oftentimes because the state, after all, is not truly everyone's. It is controlled by a ruling class, political parties, or a leading figure, be they a president, king, dictator, or so on. But I have questions about the masses and the most vulnerable people that even would be revolutionary thinkers, radical activists, and others often ignore. When wars break out, they're the people who get discarded in a mess of the dominant forces of the state and nationalism, regardless of if they've been served by such forces or not. For instance, we can observe, observe as much with this war that's currently happening in Ukraine. The repeated appearance of Nazi iconography and white supremacists in the Ukrainian military meant for some left factions in the US that all of Ukraine is Nazis. The liberal romanticization and war fever flying Ukrainian flags everywhere has not helped. But for fleeing students, immigrants, indigenous populations, 
migrants, and refugees who were not Nazis, solidarity gets lost. Those who have already been declared by some factions of the US left as Nazis get ignored. This happens because of people who frame their considerations through states and governments don't even seem to notice the people who get neglected by those structures. By the time they notice, these people were already screaming with bombs being dropped on their heads. These are the people who are always oppressed by states that kick them around. They are always oppressed by patriotic nationalists who don't want them to enter within their borders. They are always oppressed by liberal rationales that objectify them as tokens to preserve their legitimacy, to preserve the legitimacy of the states that they like. And they are even neglected by many left fraternities throughout the world that erase them in a never ending quest to fetishize states in service to their ideological aspirations. Since we're in Georgia, I'd like to explain this another way using the South as an example. During multiple environmental crises, Northern liberals have shrugged off and neglected the seriousness of people suffering and dying in the South. They have dismissed problems like climate crises and infrastructure issues when they happen in the South. Because they often act as if everyone here is deserving of condemnation because of the politics associated with Southern states. They designate everyone in the South GOP voters who deserve what's coming to us because of the ignorance and the hatred of a political party that they associate with the region. Now this is what I'm describing. People in the US do this during conflict with entire countries by homogenizing diverse populations. Another country becomes one thing. Everyone in X country is insert assigned ideology, extremism, religion, race, ethnic group, etc. This makes it easier for people to detach or to drape their theory over complex situations that dis disrupts all encompassing frameworks. It's easier to brush off atrocity when you're sitting somewhere on the other side of the world projecting your individual feelings onto a situation you cannot comprehend. Migrants, refugees, ethnic minorities, students, workers, and others are damned by where they happen to be located on a map because the state form takes ownership over the people it encloses. Those who cannot see past the state or think beyond it because they are invested in the world of nation states reaffirm that ownership. The most oppressed bear so much of the violence when people collapse populations into one thing, one identity, or one group. Black people in the US South and the global South know this quite well. Unfortunately, too many people in the US struggle with the reality that other countries are made up of different people and diverse populations. They don't allow other places their diversity because their because their complexity cannot be fathomed by many of these factions. And they see themselves as exceptional and the rest of the world as whatever they think they want it to be for their own intents and purposes. So for certain segments of the US left, everyone in Ukraine is a Nazi because there are Nazis in the Ukrainian military. For US right wing patriots, everyone in Iraq and Afghanistan is a terrorist. For US liberals, everyone in Iran is a conservative Muslim fundamentalist. We can do this all day. But what I'm trying to keep addressing here is who this hurts and how this is a natural part of what statism does to populations. The fact of the matter is we have people all over the world, people we need to have solidarity with and be working to build and struggle with. Just as just because some are patriots or just because some patriots or nationalists don't want to permit interconnectedness beyond national lines and conflate populations with state apparatuses, doesn't mean our people anywhere deserve state violence. We know this isn't the case because they ended up on some side of a border that someone drew up. The world is much deeper than the deadly lines that have been drawn. 
This is one of the shortcomings of Western radicalism as a whole. No faction of the left is perfect, and no faction of the left has completely transcended these pitfalls. And I want to refer to Cedric Robinson here because he addresses this eloquently in several texts. He writes about it with regard to Karl Marx in the terms of order, addressing the state and the uses of it for political emancipation as opposed to human emancipation. Robinson says, quote, Marx saw the relationship between the state and true emancipation quite differently. He argued that the relationship between political emancipation and human emancipation was not a true one. For him, the political was at best a devious instrument to be used for human, for human emancipation. He quotes Marx saying, by emancipating himself politically, man emancipates himself in a devious way, through an intermediary, however necessary this intermediary may be. Back to Cedric. Ultimately, the political was such an instrument because the state could not attack or change its base, civil society. This civil society, which Marx would later identify as bourgeois capitalist society, was exploitative and oppressive for the mass of its citizens." End quote. So sit with that for just a second. Then Robinson continues, the problem of the political is not merely a programmatic one. It is an analytical, conceptual, metaphysical, and epistemological one. If, in terms of one liberationist tradition, mechanistic or vulgar Marxists have understood the political in terms much more shallow and less ambiguous than Marx himself, it is also true, in the meantime, that the political has come to dominate Western social thought. It has become a basic grammar, a mediation through which the outlines of social reality have been generated. In other words, the political has become a paradigm." End quote. The political has become a paradigm. And think about that for a second as well. One of the central points I try to make in my work is that the modern US left has become too absorbed by denominational conflict to meet needs. Many of these dogmatic factions of the left are nothing more than fraternities that use radical language to try to pull in members to their organizations, their front groups, and their cliques. For them, following tradition means parroting what's already been said by dead thinkers, philosophers, and revolutionaries and plastering it onto the present. Radical texts become like holy books. They tell us, the people would be free if you would just read, insert text here, and join my organization. Just like Christian fundamentalists that tell you you'll be saved if only you'd read the Bible and join their church. This is the standard. The US is full of people who know everything because everything is answered by their totalizing, all-encompassing program. Despite the fact that they may be referencing a text that's well over a century old, orthodoxy leads many to transpose it onto people in the year 2022 with their year 2022 lives. Conditions change, but their solutions don't. Contexts are different, but their ideas are not. They just say the same thing over and over and over and over. But alas, people cannot eat quotes from people's political Bibles. They cannot pay their bills with patronizing, sanctimonious leftist piety. They cannot defend themselves with radical, puritanical moralism. They are in need, and it's going to take moralizing. It's going to take more than that moralizing and condescension to address that. But this is a lot of what you see. Endless veneration of the past with no real regard for what will or won't work in the present. And like other forms of religiosity, this operates according to a philanthropic sort of model. The diversity of groups, cultures, and varying needs of populations are ignored to the point of non-existence. You hear all about the masses and the people as if there's one thing that is one solution for all of them. People then just need a charitable leader, the charitable leadership of a revolutionary vanguard, a political party, or the state. But this, but what did Fanon tell us about the pitfalls of nationalism? 
Frantz Fanon said, quote, there is no illustrious man taking responsibility for everything. He said it's about the people and the magic lies in their hands and their hands alone. The we, then we find out for ourselves this is how it's gonna go one way or the other. One reason I'm writing about anarchism, one of the reasons, is because I'm thinking about organizing outside of the state. One of the reasons I'm going to do this is more often, not, more often than not, I'm relying on this point about statelessness. That lack of citizenship black America has found ourselves forced into. And this goes beyond the US too. When I say black America, black people inside and outside of US borders are left behind, abandoned and neglected by state structures of all types. And we see this during natural disasters, be it conflicts, uh, forced migration and otherwise. So I wanna highlight some people now that speak to this um, in a way that I feel can bring some of these points to life. And one of the first people I wanna talk about is a man named Lovett Fort Whiteman. Can I actually see a ra uh, people raise their hands if you've ever heard of Lovett Fort Whiteman before? <laughs> because of me, okay, thank you. All right. So Lovett Fort Whiteman was the son of an enslaved man who was born in Dallas, Texas in 1889, a few decades after the Dred Scott ruling of, Supreme, of the Supreme Court that said the words, the people of the United States and citizens are not synonymous terms, and basically crystallized this sort of statelessness and this lack of citizenship that still plagues many people throughout black America, obviously all of us. He was the son of an enslaved man from South Carolina who migrated to Texas. Um, he enrolled in the um, Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, where uh, he was doing work as a machinist. <clears throat> and he eventually ended up in Harlem with his mother and his sister Hazel. And this was during World War I. And then he decides to travel to Mexico where he becomes radicalized because the revolution there is in full swing. And he eventually uh, becomes radicalized, radicalized to such a point that he uh, decides to join the Socialist Party. And he travels all over the place. He goes, you know, obviously I said to Mexico, he goes to Cuba, he goes to Canada. And he comes back to the United States ready to organize and ready to um, get, get involved and he becomes what uh, several historians would refer to as the black, the first black communist in the U.S. And Lovett Fort Whiteman um, wants to go to uh, Russia because he wants to get more involved and take his radicalism to the next level. And he, he travels there obviously because of the influence of Russian revolutionary activity. And he gets there just years after Vladimir Lenin has passed away just months, I'm sorry, after, after Lenin has passed. And he goes as one of the hundreds of delegates, delegates to the Fifth Congress of the Communist International. And he becomes the first black American student to attend the Communist University of the Toilers of the East. And he becomes very active in the new USSR. Um, he, he's in audiences with Stalin and Ho Chi Minh. Uh, he's very active in traveling back and forth between the United States and the USSR, trying to build a revolutionary connective movement between black America and the revolutionary uprising and transformation that had taken place uh, with, with the uh, Bolsheviks. And, uh, you know, a historian, named, historian, a historian named Theodore Draper wrote that Lovett's continued emphasis on race was what pushed the common turn, the Communist International, to stop evading the ticklish question of race antagonism. This was one of the central things that was really important about Lovett's uh, life. He was pushing this question of race when it was a very controversial thing, and it still is in some circles, to prioritize race just as much as class. And he was a strong party line man. He, he was very much, let's just go with what the party says, Let's, let's follow the order of the, 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 the state and, and push forward that way through the vehicle of the state. And the thing about it was, though, he still was asking a lot of hard questions about race. So he's being monitored by the FBI, obviously. Time Magazine had named him the reddest of the blacks. And he was 
an outspoken orator. He was an organizer. He was working alongside Harry Haywood, who wrote the book Black Bolshevik, many of you maybe have heard about. And he was doing uh, some pretty pivotal organizing at the time. The success of it is obviously debatable. Many of the things that he was building did not work out. But J. Edgar Hoover personally assigned an agent to his case. This is how much uh, he was standing out. And nonetheless, uh, you know, Lovett is, is really uh, becoming somewhat iconic for his time. And keep in mind that there are a lot of black people around the world in the USSR at this time who are traveling there because of the uprising and the revolution and who are going there seeking new freedom. And things become increasingly tense. Lovett gets caught, Lovett catches the attention of the secret uh, police for his questioning about race. And this was a controversial thing, as I, as I mentioned. And he starts to feel increasingly isolated, and he becomes uh, kind of distanced from some people in his circles because they, you know, they tell him, you know, you're pushing on this too much. And then the, the purges start happening during uh, Stalin's reign. And because of some problems he had with other people and because of his isolation, he gets pointed at as somebody that's not trustworthy. And then during the Stalinist purges, Lovett is taken and sent to a work camp where he is enslaved and worked to death. And he was killed by the Soviet state. But you don't hear his story a lot because it really disturbs the more romantic notions that we hear about everything that the USSR represented. Let me tell you about another person. His name was Robert Robinson. He was a Jamaican-born toolmaker who also went to the uh, Soviet Union around this time at the age of 23. He was recruited to work. Um, some Soviet officials saw him working in an auto factory and asked him to come to the USSR and help. And at the time, this made a lot of sense because this was during the Great Depression. And he's figuring, I'm black. I'm probably going to get fired first when they start cutting people. I'll go to the Soviet Union. There's a lot of big changes happening over there. And I'll be able to have a new life where I can maybe make some money. And so he goes over there on, on this invitation. And for context, um, Lenin wanted Ford Motor Company to come to the Soviet Union originally. But they signed a deal under Stalin to buy and produce cars in 1929. And um, style, there, was a, there was a connection there between, between uh, the Ford Motor Company and what was, what was developing in the, in, the, in the USSR. So Robinson makes his way there. He starts working. Um, the US had ordered him eventually to return or to give up his citizenship. And he's been there for some years. And he wanted to return, but the Soviets eventually basically kind of convinced him to stay longer. And then he stays longer, but then he decides, I actually do want to go back to the US. And they say, no, you can't leave. And so then he becomes basically a hostage. And he's repeatedly trying to leave the Soviet Union. He's, he's like, you know, why, why can't I just go back to the US? And they're, they're repeatedly denying him exit. And in his biography, he details meeting Paul Robeson and asking Paul Robeson to help him leave the USSR so he could try to come back to the US. And Paul Robeson told him he couldn't help him. And Robinson survives the German invasion. He survives the Stalinist purges. And he actually talked about hearing from a friend of a friend about Love at Fort Whiteman being killed in the Gulag during those purges I just mentioned. And that's one of the records of what happened, aside from the fact that he actually had a death certificate and it was documented by the state that, they, that he was killed in the Gulag. But this is another black person who had gone there seeking this new opportunity, seeking a better life, new citizenship under this state, and is now trying to escape. He ends up being there for 44 years. And he, is, he actually gets away by finally being able to plan a trip to Uganda which he got permission to go on for a vacation. And then when he gets there, he escapes in Uganda, and he claims asylum under Idi Amin. He married a US professor, a professor, and that's how he got citizenship again and was able to make his way back. So 
This is another story you don't, you don't hear often. And the final story I'd like to tell you was about my, one of my mentors, who is Lorenzo Combo Irvin. And some of you might have heard his story before. But Lorenzo was a former Black Panther, a former member of SNCC. And he was a founding black anarchist. And he became disillusioned with the Black Panther Party. He became disillusioned with a lot of the liberalism of mass, black mass movements. And he eventually has these trumped up charges against him where he decides to flee to Cuba. And when he's trying to flee these charges, obviously we all, for the most part, probably know the story of Asada. This was during a period where there was something called skyjacking. And this was, uh, this was basically radicals were fleeing the US with such regularity that they had this term skyjacking, which describes people who were hijacking planes just to go to Cuba. And people were going to Cuba so much that Cuba actually started trying to create a deal with the Nixon government to stop these radicals from coming to Cuba. Raise your hand if you've heard about that. Good, awesome. That's way more than I expected. So that just wanted to get, so I just wanted to get a little context for the room. So with this sort of deal that they had started developing to try to stop this influx of people fleeing there, Lorenzo ends up there thinking that he's going to get away to a place where he's in a different sort of political situation. And he finds out something quite different when he gets there. He's actually imprisoned. And there were other black radicals who were in prison there. And they had a place called the Hijack Hotel where they were holding them. And so eventually he gets deportation papers and they send him to Czechoslovakia. He was a Maoist at the time. He was not an anarchist. Um, and he gets these deportation papers. They send him to Czechoslovakia. He gets to Czechoslovakia where he's imprisoned again because they're like, why are you sending him here? Then once he's in prison there, he escapes with the help of a lot of black student organizing that was happening. And then he flees to East Germany. In East Germany, he's captured by uh, the CIA. And if you listen to Lorenzo talk and you read his work, he talks about how he fled to three state socialist projects, was imprisoned in each one of them, and eventually still caught by US authorities despite this idea that he had that these states were going to be in such opposition to the US that they wouldn't ever give up another, uh, another status radical who was from the US trying to flee. And he's shipped back to the US. He's put in prison. He's transferred around until he meets a man named Martin Sostry, who introduces him to anarchism. And obviously, after the experiences he had, he was much more open-minded about what anarchism <laughs> had to say. So um, those three stories I wanted to bring up are real life examples, and there are several more I could go into. I'm writing about a lot of them. But it is this idea that if you just change the nature of the state, if you just create a new state model and put it on top of people, put it, uh, establish it on top of people, on top of their situations, that it is going to be liberation. And the problem is that, as I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, black people and the statelessness we experience, the challenges to citizenship that are posed by our conditions in this country because of the fact that we were never meant to be citizens. Um, these are things that disturb this idea that a state can be the method that liberates everyone. Because in order to do this, to have this, this idea that there's going to be a revolutionary state model, states always require ruling classes and they require nationalisms that are going to exclude people and define an other and a group of people that do not belong and those who do, those who are citizens and those who are not, those who are of the state and those who are stateless. So what connects these three is how they all show the contradictions across the spectrum of states. Black people feeling the need to seek home and place and safety and asylum elsewhere, finding state violence, even when they went to state socialist countries where conditions were, are endlessly venerated and discussed by Western leftists. So you see the point I'm trying to make earlier about how these models are just endlessly venerated. We hear these romanticized stories about these states. Everything went right. We just need to do it again. 
And these stories like Lovett, these stories like Lorenzo, these stories like Robert Robinson are virtually unheard of. And when you bring them up, either they're ignored or you, you know, I've, I've, maybe you get called a fed, you know, you know how it goes. <laughs> so again, the experiences of statelessness, un stateless, undocumented and asylum seeking people will endlessly show the danger that the state form poses to the world. And at a time that I think it's important to conceptualize liberation, not just as new politicians or new governance, but as a process that is actually grounded in overcoming the terms that have been established at our expense. This world needs complete transformation, not a new uniform. Treating liberation as if it's some final destination does not make sense when the planet is constantly in flux and things are always changing. None of us can come up with an ideological or political prescription that predicts everything. The failures of the past can, be pro can help us progress, but we can't analyze the failures if we refuse to admit them. So I wanted to talk about all of this in relation to the current moment and talk about how our lives speak to this. Um, and these are just some of the examples from my work, but I would love to um, just discuss some of these things with you. If you have any questions or thoughts you'd like to share about what I just talked about, I would love to hear them. This is, this is everything I had to say to you today. We have a um, microphone set up here. I think that if anybody has any questions they want to pitch to William, uh, you can line up right here. And um, please keep them very brief because we are trying to get out of the library pretty soon um, so that these wonderful library workers can go home. Um, but yes, go ahead. Hello. I guess uh, my name is Langston Thomas. And I was really processing everything you were saying about the state kind of requiring um, a ruling class and creating these boundaries that always oppress people. And I'm a PhD student um, at Georgia State, uh, political science PhD student, and I study democracy, democratic culture, polarization. And in my work, I found that every democracy that has existed has been founded on this sort of paradoxical culture between the principles of democracy that are inclusionary and then the actual culture of exclusion that they propagate in every context that democracy has existed. And so in connecting that to your view of the state, I'm wondering, is it the state that is inherently bad or is it the fact that there hasn't been a state founded with a value system that is conducive to healthy community and all the types of changes in living that we'd want to see? Um, yeah, so I guess that, that's my question, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I, um, I, think that, uh, I think that the world has had enough opportunity and chance to have a state that would prove otherwise. And I think that uh, it's inherent in the state form because what we know as the state is very much a Western invention. Mm -hmm. And when we think about the legacies of colonialism and slavery, mm -hmm and exclusion that are required to do state building in the global capitalist world in the global capitalist world that we know there's not ever going to be a state that doesn't adapt to um to the terms that have been established and f you know one of the th best ways to think about this in my opinion is often term oftentimes in in with regard to abolition when we're talking about policing and prisons and we're thinking about um, national security, we know that a lot of times people will say things like, you know, um, the justice system is broken and it's not broken, it's working exactly as intended. Right. The state is working exactly as intended. Mm -hmm. And when we look at it as a container for the violence of the police and for prisons, um, you know, there isn't any sort of, you know, there's this, there's this idea that people have in their heads that you have the state socialist countries and the capitalist countries and they're, they're like completely separate. But their ruling classes are all doing business with one another. 
there, you know, I just talked about, for example, with the Soviet Union, right. one of the first, Lenin's like, hey, get Ford over here. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And Stalin is like, hey, yeah, Ford Motor, let's do, you know, it's, they weren't like, this is a capitalist, evil corporation, we can't do business with, they were like, we get over here, we gotta do, biz we gotta do business, we need this for our economy. It's so, there's this idea that there's this separation that you, these, this line that you can draw, but this is, this is politics, that's poli the politics of states. Like geopolitics. Yeah, this is, this is the, this is the terms that has been established. So there is no real separation, and if there was going to be, it would have happened by now. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at it, particularly in this global moment of environmental catastrophe. Like we, like we can't, we can't afford to remain invested in this form that is destroying the planet through industry and through expansion and through imperialism and through war. We have to start thinking outside of it. So that's, that's my opinion. That makes sense. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you so much. You've violated so many thoughts. <laughs> that I've just been having about, you know, political discourse on the left. Um, and my question is, uh, I guess, towards this idea of, like, imagining something different. Um, like, I feel like people overlook um, how power is exercised in, like, a private sphere. You know, how, how people exercise power over other people and how, like, we're forming the ways that we behave in a private sphere uh, is just as important to a liberation project as how we organize ourselves as a collective. Um, so I'm wondering like, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Can, you, can you be a little bit more specific about your question? Like, um, like being nice to people, you know? <laughs> like like uh, my little uh, pony friendship is magic kind of energy, you know, of like being a kind and loving person in like the ways that you treat people, how how can we imagine that into um, our liberation projects? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you need to talk and read this 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 man's work over here, Modibo Kadali, and uh, think about uh, some of the some of the work that he's really uh, been highlighting around uh, intimate social democracy and. The, I think inter, intimate, don't direct democracy, I'm sorry. And think about um, how, our, how our relationships really establish, uh, how our, really, our relationships really establish and provide um, a model that can uh, help us, I think, answer a lot of those bigger questions. I really, I really frame most of my thinking about that through black feminism, honestly. And, um, particularly because of um, the questions about the personal and the political and the implications of both and how they relate to one another. But I don't, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I have like a, have like a, a, a like a, a concise answer for that. Um, I know that how I form, how I form relationships and how I treat people in my day to day life um, matters completely with regard to my politics and the world that I envision. And I think that even just the fact that like, we're people sitting in, sitting in a space together right now and we're con being considerate even about masking and, and thinking about these things in this particular moment where people are just kind of like throwing it to the window when there's an ongoing pandemic is, is like actually a, a, a significant statement. So I think that is, you know, it's, it is extremely important. I don't know if that answers your, if that answers your question at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was more of like a, you know, wanting you to talk about it, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm trying my best up here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hey, what's up? Um, yeah, so I just had a question. Uh, this is something I've had a couple of conversations with just today, and I figured uh, since you're doing the keynote and you've written about black anarchism, um, yeah, someone who's been involved in like a variety of like black anarchist groups over like the last couple of years, um, there the main tension uh, is between within black anarchist groups. I've seen has b been between um, anti-organizational and like more like formal organizational or orientations. And uh, what do you think, like, because like. 
for instance, like, I guess, I'm trying to frame, I guess like, it, it seems like sometimes that the black left is like so much more like disorganized, like unfortunately by the white left, and there's reasons for that, right? Like the white left has more you know, access to you know, money and all these things, but like, I guess like, what do you, do you think like, um, you know, if black anarchism has, you know, sort of over the last, you know, like 20, 30 years, like there hasn't really been like consistent, you know what I'm saying? Like consistent, like black anarchists have participated in struggle, but there haven't been like organizations that have like really emerged. And like, do you think that like for like the black left, there needs to be like some sort of like black anarchist like organization? Or do you think, like, I just curious about your thoughts on like kind of organization in like a broader, you know what I'm saying? Like a broader sense, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly believe that um, I would be contradicting myself if I tried to like say that there was a definite answer because I think that that's gonna depend specifically on black, what those black communities look like and if they want to have a specific organization or not. I mean, I know that like I've been a part of several um, radical organizations uh, that have done a lot of amazing things and that have failed and I've organized a lot through the organization model and outside of it. But I don't think that there's any one, um, that there's any one way that it has to be gone about. I'm just happy that more people are even entertaining the idea of black anarchism. And that's really the, the, um, the purpose of my work is to just like try to actually highlight what I feel is a movement um, and what I feel like is a, a, a pivot away from traditional sort of orthodoxies that are really stale at this point. So um, for me, it's, it's more so I think that that is going to be uh, reliant on people's individual um, and communal autonomy to decide for themselves if that, if that model is going to meet their needs. Because obviously, um, you know, we've seen what happens with like national sort of organizational structures like BLM. We saw, we can read about what happened with the Black Panther Party and its chapters. And this, the way that this history sort of uh, repeats itself in certain ways is um, I think really a call for us to like question whether there's going to be one way that it happens or not. And for black anarchists, I think that they're going to have to decide uh, within their their own communities, what makes most sense? So, yeah, thanks. You're welcome. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, thanks. Um, I thought your your stories about you know the experiences of these black activists in the Soviet Union were really powerful. That I wanted to make um, a few comments and hear what you think about them. But I think um, when we talk about the nature of the Soviet Union and Cuba, I think we need to even move beyond the terminology of like state socialism, and we can't give like any um, credence to the to the idea that these societies were socialist in any kind of way. I think it's even more correct to describe them as state capitalists, because instead of the workers being like exploited by like uh, you know individual companies, they're exploited by a bureaucracy that enacts as a as a ruling class. Yeah. But this is where I really want your thoughts, because I don't think we can use the um, terrible examples of the Soviet Union to discredit what you know, Marx, Engels, and even people like Lenin really had to say about the nature of the state. And this is why I think they have a lot in common with anarchists, where, where they say that really, that the task of, of revolutionaries is actually to smash the bourgeois state. And this is what is the difference between a revolutionary socialist revolution and a bourgeois revolution. Bourgeois revolutions has, have perfected the state machineries, while the task of a revolutionary socialist machine um, um, revolution is for the workers to smash the state. The difference is that I think the, the anarchists, you know, have a total rejection of the state, where Marx does argue for a worker state that is qualitatively different than any bourgeois state. And that worker state arises out of the necessity to actually defend the gains of the revolution. And because you need some kind of symmetry to your, to your MME. When you overthrow the ruling class of a given country, what they're going to do is they're going to crack down on you. And you need some form of organization you know, that is led by the working people, for the working people, that can organize the fight back and expropriate the bourgeoisie in the process. And this is when the question of the worker state becomes an important one. And I wanted to know what you think about that. I mean, I, I completely agree with you about state, state capitalism. Um, I don't use the term state capitalism all the time because not everybody um, always necessarily wants to have a conversation in that, 
and that term, and actually even talking about uh, state socialism is, I think, only now getting to a point where people even feel that that term is more appropriate. I mean, for many years, socialism was, has been synonymous with statism. So when you say socialist, people automatically think you're talking about this, you know, building a, a state. And so the broader socialist movement has been pretty neglected um, in terms of the anti-state factions and the anarchists and uh, libertarian factions of the historical socialist movement. So I think that I often terms use the term state socialism just so at a baseline there's an understanding that not all socialism is trying to build a state. So I use that term because I'm really speaking in terms of where I've met, met people mostly understanding that, that from. And so, I, but I wholeheartedly agree with you when we're talking about uh, state capitalism. But in terms of everything that you were talking about uh, with regard to um, discrediting Marx and um, Engels and you know, in terms of actually building a work a worker's state, I mean, I mean, I I feel basically what I already said. If like if I think that this was going to be something that was feasible and that was going to be um, really the way that we were going to go about changing the world, that I think I, I just think it would have already been done. And I think that there's been a lot of people who've built really, really, absolutely revolutionary movements to do such a thing that haven't necessarily achieved it and we have to be critical of that history and be thoughtful about it. That's really all I'm saying. If somebody does it and it works and it proves me wrong, then ignore everything I said. But in other words, you know, if it's gonna happen, it'll speak for itself and it hasn't yet. Karl Marx is one of my favorite writers. Not Engels, but Marx is. <laughs> And I'll just tell you right now, I have a lot of love and admiration and respect for Marx, even though he drew a lot of conclusions that I disagree with. So I'm not trying to uh, discourage people from uh, studying what I feel is important history. I'm just saying that don't endlessly venerate it until it becomes a religion where you think that it's the only way that things can be done to overcome the terms that have been established at our expense. So if people want to try to build a revolutionary worker state, they're free, I'm not gonna stop them. But I'm just saying that a lot of people already have and it hasn't worked and maybe it's time for us to think of a different approach. What time? Yeah, you can look. Well, I wanna thank our keynote speaker, my friend William Anderson, uh, for his time today and I wanna thank all of you for joining us the 2022 Atlanta Radical Book Fair. It means so much to us that you came back out. Thank you so much. Please give yourselves a round of applause. We hope to see you again next year. And, um, and please be safe and let's, uh, let's try to get uh, all the folks who work here at the library a round of applause and get them home quickly.